Your Excellency, uh, Dr. Hage Godwin Kekop, President of the Republic of Namibia. Your Excellency, Mr. Paul Kangame, President of the Republic of Rwanda. Honorable Ministers, Deputy Ministers, and other senior government officials, Namibia and Rwanda media. Welcome to the media hall. Our program here is going to be very, very short. And without further ado, it is my honor to invite His Excellency, President of the Republic of Namibia, to make few remarks. Your Excellency. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> I'm very happy to welcome my brother. Down, the Republic of Namibia. I regard him as a reformer when he was a chair of AU. He reformed AU. We are going to pay dues ourselves instead of depending on others paying for us. That was not an easy process, but he's a doer. Now, since Namibia is a young country, we learn from good practices. So that's why I invited him to come here. We had shared views. Things I have seen in Rwanda, I asked him, how did you do it? And in this short time, I was at a university. So I'm very happy to welcome my brother. Feel at home, he's feeling at home, and with his delegation, it's not the first and the last time we agreed. We'll be exchanging views, not only by visit, but also by sending our envoys and also instruct them to do things. And we'll get some Rwandese to also come, like the lady we had the other day at the economic uh, conference. Uh, she made a statement and made an impact. So. Welcome, my brother and your delegation to Namibia. Land of the brave. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. May I now invite His Excellency, the President of Rwanda, to make few remarks, Your Excellency. the friendship between uh, and the people of Rwanda and uh, the connection between us, the president, uh, anything we can do together, uh, two countries, but uh, also doing it together with the rest of uh, uh, other brothers and sisters across the continent. Thank you very much. I just realized uh, the Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. It's now the media to post few questions. Please identify yourself 
uh, and let me pose a question. And again, because of the time, don't make too long comments. Maybe go straight to the question. The floor is open for you, Media. Good morning, Mr. President. Um, I am Shiligan Peterson from Namibia Press Agency. My first question is, um, Mr. President Kigame, um, over the last few weeks, we've had town hall meetings, and one of the prominent um, issues around the country that came out was tribalism, and which, late, which causes a division within our country. Um, thinking back or in relation to your, your history in your country and um, the tragedy that happened, you, you, you managed to build unity within the country. Um, what is your recommendation or your thoughts on this? Well, I, I, well, I will start by saying tribalism or any division or divisive politics uh, is not good for anyone. It's not good for Namibia, it's not good for Rwanda, it's not good for any uh, other country. But it is a problem that can be addressed. Uh, just going by what we have also tried to do in my own country, I have no doubt that uh, Namibia, if faced with such a problem, uh, people have within themselves the capacity to overcome this challenge or any other challenge. Uh, starting from that point where it is not necessary it's for people now to look at what uh, is of common interest to, to them and use actually whatever difference uh, people have uh, for uh, opening up a discussion that drives towards what is good for all of them, not just for one group or the other or one person or another. This is the foundation uh, one has to uh, step on to move forward to deal with any division or, or tribalism. I, I think I have no worries that uh, if you have uh, good leaders like uh, my brother here, Hage Gengop, we, we, you will have uh, a problem solved. The leaders are supposed to be addressing this and you have uh, a leader I have worked with, I have known, and uh, uh, other leaders that he works with as a team, uh, I'm sure they will all work together to address uh, whatever problem. It's, it's not necessary, but it's a problem that exists not only in Namibia, it has existed in other places. It has existed in my own country. Uh, Unfortunately, you find it is uh, in many places, but we have to overcome it, and uh, I'm sure Namibia will. Could I, could I just mm -hmm. add? The way my sister put it is as if Namibia is now plunged into tribalism. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say that. We came from divided society where there were bantu stands here, we were told you are this tribe, you belong there, but we formed a government, central government, and even racially brought our people together. What is happening is the question of people trying to get rich quickly. They see, the, they have a hope. They see the light at the end of a tunnel. They see others, that side, looking good, and they say, I am left out. Therefore, I must also hurry to be there. But in doing that, they show anger. They think they are left out. But I think to say tribalism as if, or racism, as if pervasive in Namibia is not true. I'm a minority. If tribalism was there, I wouldn't have been president. So we should a little bit do rough on us. Tribalism is raising its ugly head. So is also racism. But it's also caused by poverty, when people feel they are left out. And then they go back, of course, when a person is successful, I always say that, I, I, I. But when a politician fails, 
he goes and say, we are left out. Those are the symptoms we are seeing now in this country. But we never tolerate tribalism, as long as I'm here. So it's not tribalism per se, it's poverty driving people to think I want to also be there. And then to say, our tribe is left out. Our region is left out. And now nobody can leave any region out. I talk about a house I'm building composed of bricks, which are our ethnic groups. When you have plastered that wall, you must no longer identify this tribe, that race, and so on. Join me just to build that. They will make it. Thank you, Your Excellency. The next question. Right. <coughs> Thank you for the opportunity, Your Excellencies. My name is Akio Sikela from the Namibia newspaper. Um, I have two questions directed to uh, President Kagame. Um, there are speculations that um, your administration is, is ruling the country with a tight fist. Uh, we understand that free speech and freedom of the media is not guaranteed in Rwanda. And people are, and your critics or people that uh, criticize the government are um, harassed, continuously harassed, and some of them apparently disappear. Can you, can, can you just maybe uh, tell us what is happening in Rwanda with regards to free speech? Uh, the second question is, is with regards to your, um, your term in office. You have been in power for almost about two decades, and we understand that there are also plans that you might rule for, for until 20, 20, 20, 2034. Do you, can you tell us maybe, do you, take, do, do you have plans to, do you, do you have plans to step down as president of Rwanda and let other people, people mm -hmm. lead? Mm -hmm. Or are you planning to, to stay in power until, uh, until eternity? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, one, um, have you ever been to Rwanda? I, I invite you. I invite you to come and, uh, and see and hear from people. Talk to, talk to Rwandans. I think that's the most important thing. If you hear from Rwandans directly, if you see for yourself, if, feel free to ask whatever question you want, but uh, directly hear from people that, that will maybe answer the first question much better than I would. But um, what I know as leads my country, lives there, works with the people. And I have come to be present on the basis of the choice of the people of Rwanda. And uh, I think together in the country, we've been making good progress on many fronts. Uh, also, we have come from uh, a very low base on everything whether it is poverty or human rights or independent uh, uh, and freedom of you know, independence or freedom of speech, which you all talked about. We uh, have come from a very low base. I think we've been uh, taking the country uh, to a much better situation than where we have been. Uh, are there problems in my country or have there been problems? Absolutely. We are one of those countries that uh, have had uh, uh, a lot of problems. Uh, the tragedy that befell my country 25 years ago, uh, I think that is the story that uh, is known all over the world. Unfortunately, we are more known for that than uh, uh, better things that have uh, happened thereafter. And we make progress not to be credited for, for it. We, we really make progress for ourselves. Uh, we, 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 but as you said, there are speculations. Uh, in, in fact, that's what I wanted to clear with you that instead of having speculations reach you, if you are in a place, if you see, if you hear from people directly, 
then you are able to answer the questions arising out of those speculations. I can confidently say here today and now that uh, the people of my country are working very hard to improve their lives. They are happy with what they have, whether it is in terms of uh, their leaders or with each other, working together and, and uh, making a difference uh, for themselves between uh, 25 years ago and now. Uh, if you find a, a much better place than we have uh, uh, in our country, I, I invite you to let me know. Uh, so we, we, we are very fine, very fine, really. But with the problems that we have to deal with every day, every day there is a problem. I think uh, uh, President, uh, my brother here mentioned uh, poverty that uh, creates other problems and, and so on. We, we have to deal with that as well. And we have uh, been reducing uh, the problem, uh, levels of poverty, uh, very fast in actual fact. Uh, so it is helping us to resolve those other issues uh, that people talk about. So I, I just give you guarantees that we are doing fine. On the third, uh, on the second question uh, about uh, my <coughs> position, my responsibility as regards uh, being president up to when. Uh, well, first of all, uh, uh, to begin with, uh, I wasn't sure I was becoming president before I became president. I didn't even plan so hard to become one. Fate drove me to be president. And the people of my country, in the end, insisted I become president for them. I've been doing everything uh, possible to fit in that role uh, of leading my people and uh, working with my people to address as many problems uh, we have as, as well and hard as we can. And uh, at one, last year, no, no, two years ago, 2017, when we had elections, before that, actually, I had wanted to say to them that uh, I needed to have uh, them choose uh, my successor. They are the ones who declined and uh, said they wanted me to go. Uh, this is on record. Uh, whether it was in my party, the Rwandese party at front, or the outside parties, they decided I continue. They carried out the changes they carried out. But I also have told them publicly and continue to tell them that, uh, yes, uh, sometimes I follow their dictates in as far as that particular problem is concerned, but they should also consider uh, my position as a human being and uh, uh, the position I may hold that uh, has uh, good grounds. Uh, so we might have to resolve this matter uh, between us, uh, among us, and between me and them going forward. Uh, so don't worry about uh, how far you go <laughs> in leading my people. I think let them worry about that. <laughs> and, and, and they will solve that problem, and I will be there working with them to address that problem. Thank you, His Excellency, for the response. Uh, next question. Yeah. Response. Good, good afternoon, or good morning, Your Excellencies. My name is Edward Mumbu. I'm a journalist with the Namibia Press Agency, NAMPA. Uh, my first question is directed to uh, our two presidents. 
Uh, firstly, just I want you to brief us on the meeting that you had. What areas of cooperation perhaps uh, the two countries are exploring? Uh, what Namibia can learn from Rwanda and what Rwanda can also learn from us? That's one. Yeah, the second question is uh, on the economy, the economic growth uh, of Rwanda, which is projected at uh, just a little bit over 7%, if I'm correct. Uh, uh, how have you been able to do this uh, at a time when the global economy is, is actually not doing that well? And uh, tying in with this one is there are also reports that these figures have been cooked up and they do not reflect the reality on the ground. Yeah, Mr. Gagame, just uh, tell us. Mm -hmm. The president. Yeah, the young man. Thank you very much. Uh, we are here to learn. The president is going to give the answer. But between us, I think jokes with you. You went to say, I said, it's none of my, your business. And that became a story. I was joking with you. Don't do that. <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going to remain friends, huh? Mm -hmm. OK? Very good. Yes, thank you. Um, the growth of uh, our economy, uh, uh, to begin with, uh, is real. It's very real. It's, it's felt by the people of our country, uh, the, it originates with them. Uh, they are the ones who toil and put in hard work every day in everything. Uh, if you look at how much uh, agriculture has grown, for example, uh, to a point of, uh, uh, first of all, food security level, if we see how people are able to feed themselves, which has never been the case before. In fact, uh, growth, for example, in that sector of agriculture uh, started uh, um, about 12 years ago. We had never had growth in our agriculture sector ever in the history of our country until maybe 12 years ago. That's when we started seeing and it's not just growth by numbers, it's growth that is felt uh, in the farmers' pockets, in the, how they are able to feed themselves or sell their, what they produce uh, to neighboring countries. So this is why it is very easy to measure uh, the impact the aspects of our growth so that you, 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 you can't cook these numbers uh, unless, uh, and, and if, you, if you are able to do that and everybody in the world that deals with you in actually scrutinizing these numbers uh, also follows that, then there is a problem in the world. It's not a problem just in Rwanda. If everybody follows the cooked numbers when they are every day in the country, uh, and and if Rwandans who tell you, they, I mean, the, if I were, went into details to prove the, the point that uh, what is happening in Rwanda is real, we would probably spend the whole day here. So I won't do that. But really, when we have. Uh, uh, the, the, a population that is so growing, we have economy that is growing, and if you have an economy that is growing at the same time having a population growing, it means something is really being done at a, uh, a very fast rate. And if you see uh, what uh, you see uh, and hear from people's experience, <coughs> you start understanding that uh, what we are doing is real. It's, 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 uh, again, if you can visit, uh, you know, this conversation is better to be had with directly with the people. If you came to my country, we will make sure that you have access to any part of the country, talk to the people directly. They will tell you the story that 
or you will see things they will show you that uh, uh, will make you believe uh, that uh, the improvements uh, in our economy, in the well-being of our people are real. Um, so what is, uh, can I say about that? Uh, but there is still room uh, for improvement, for things to be covered. Uh, and we are working hard to, to achieve that. So, uh, by the way, I also found out recently that the people who are responsible for that study about cooking numbers relating to our growth and improvement. When I also asked them, I said, have you ever been to Rwanda? Mm -hmm. I found they haven't been there. <laughs> so that, that is uh, that's really fascinating because everyone who wants to be the authority on a country on what is happening in the country doesn't know the country. And when you push hard and challenge, they say, hey, you know, no, but we had this thing from so and so. We had we, we, we went on the internet and I mean <laughs> the internet is not the best place to look for the truth that uh, you want to believe. Certainly, there is a lot of information there, but you have to do, you know, some selection of what is real and what is not real and what you want to believe. So, but here we are, uh, we, 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 our country. We feel. But by the way, if we cooked numbers, we would be cheating ourselves. We wouldn't mm -hmm. be cheating anybody else. Uh, I, I don't think these people who write stories about us. Uh, people we want to please or to satisfy that, uh, no, we want to satisfy ourselves. Uh, and I think it originates from uh, also the stereotypes, the, the prejudice that is always out there. It's as if Africans can't do fine. Africans have to be doing things that must be validated by others yeah. somewhere. But we, we, we don't need any validation. We, we, we want to do things that benefit us, that put us in a place where we want to be. Uh, it's not uh, that we want to please these guys who tell a lot of stories about us. Yeah, let me just also use this opportunity to say that there was an article Front line, Namibia is sinking in corruption. 75% of Namibians apparently express that. Now, I just finished nationwide town hall meetings. Corruption question came out twice in 14, over 10,000 people we are consulting. We were talking about bread and butter issue. Corruption issue, as mentioned in Swakopmund by one businessman who talked about the road from Okahandia to Ventu, and that we have extended to the same builder. Isn't that a corruption if you didn't advertise and so on? We answered him, we did it transparently, openly. Look at the figures. If you are going to have a new company to come, first you advertise, you take time. Then they have to come and establish themselves, bringing their equipment and so on. That would be 70, now $80 million just to bring equipment. They have to also pay those who are there to now move their things, $70 million. And then time where we are saving 200 million. Now you would rather want to waste the time plus to get a new people to come to prove the point. As long as we are transparent and answer, we did that. And we are saving the country 200 million dollars. But I did at least consult the whole country and I got two people talking about corruption. Somebody sitting in the office, in one of your offices, is writing to say 75% Namibians are feeling Namibia is thinking in corruption. 
That's what the president is talking about. So I went all over, 14 regions, sitting in a meeting for seven hours, listening, people asking questions that didn't come up. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. The time is not really on our side, but I'll allow one more last question. Thank you so much. My name is Blanche, a journalist at the Namibian Broadcasting Corporation. Um, my questions are on, my two questions just on regional and continental matters. Firstly, President Kagame, you have a very beautiful capital city. Uh, with my first question, I would like to, I also need a comment from the former SADC chairperson on this. Uh, in the past, your government or your country has expressed um, willingness to join SADC, uh, the SADC bloc. I just want to know whether those sentiments are still, are still there. And also just a comment from uh, President Gengob. And my second question is on the uh, post-2020 agreement that Africa is um, still negotiating with the European Union, the Cotonou Agreement. It, under your chairmanship, uh, President Kagame, um, AU expressed uh, to say that it's time Africa uh, uh, negotiates as a bloc and leave out the ACP countries because according to you, there are uh, issues facing Africa as a continent alone. You gave examples of migrants and refugees and so on. So. Do you still feel that way? Because Namibia was one of those countries uh, strongly objecting to ACP countries being left out, saying that they are African. I think. Mm -hmm. May I go first? Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, firstly, OK, let me go first. OK. Uh, let's go back to the formation of OAU, two blocks. Casablanca and Monrovia block. President Nyerere and Kwame Nkrumah, I will say. Kwame Nkrumah wanted to have an immediate union of Africa. And Nyerere says, now let's have first regional integration. We're still going to arrive. So given that, that we therefore have regional uh, commissions, RECs, to harmonize regional development with the aim of one day becoming one. There are subsets of AU, the Rex. So therefore, one day we have to join each one of them. It, have, it doesn't matter if I'm going to join one of them. If Rwanda wants to come one day to join, fulfill the requirements, these Rex are subsets of AU. If you're a member of the AU, one day you want to have now continental free trade area. You are going towards that one. So you want to come and start to join, as I was telling the ministers, if you're a cabinet minister and it's a committee, cabinet committee, you can come and sit in and listen. It's a, it's a subcommittee of the cabinet. Same thing applies here. Thank you. But I may, there is something, President, I'm reminded we left out maybe about cooperation yeah. between our two countries. I'd quickly say something, what we discussed, I think. It's the usual two levels, really. One, we were talking about our bilateral relations, uh, and the discussion was broad. It covers almost all the areas you, you, you would understand, and I'm sure our people have been uh, fine-tuning specific areas of uh, cooperation which will be ma made known to you, but it was broad, bilateral relations. Uh, there are no restrictions to which area, uh, any of those areas. Each, each of the areas we, we learn from each other. There is something to learn from one another. Uh, Rwanda learning number of things from Namibia, Namibia learning few things from Rwanda. We, 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 we want to tighten that. We are spoiled for choice and a number of things to, to learn uh, from one another. The other level is how we work together bilaterally, but stepping from that, we look at matters continental. Uh, the continent has been uh, undertaking reforms, reforms that affect the whole continent, all of us. 
and uh, Namibia has been uh, very uh, involved and supportive of uh, uh, the reforms that uh, Africa must undertake to keep getting better in all areas on all fronts. So those are, uh, in a nutshell, things we discussed in, in just before we came here. Uh, then to, to your questions, uh, one, uh, I think the president has uh, uh, helped me answer the question about uh, whether we still pursue uh, being uh, members of SADC. I think what, if you are aware, there are things going on already to actually to try and merge uh, SADC, COMESA, ECOWAS, and so on. We, we are moving towards bringing these uh, institutions together. Uh, so for me, uh, as I understand it, uh, there is not that much uh, urgency to say I want to belong to that, say I want to belong to that, because the tendency is and the trend is to bring all these things to work together. So if we are working together, I'm happy that that is the best way uh, to go. Uh, so then um, on the cotton uh, stuff, I think there is clarification here to be made. Uh, uh, most of the things, in my view, even apply to some kind of logic and, and, and rationale. We, in fact, it wasn't to do away with the uh, um, the Caribbean and the Pacific countries. In my view, it was to rationalize, to say there are things that actually apply specifically between Africa, as we know it, continental Africa, uh, and the European Union. And then there are others that may apply uh, between Europe and Africa, uh, Caribbean and Pacific. So those are there. In fact, if you also look at the history of how that happened, SCP uh, as to where, they were building on certain things. Uh, and for example, um, when there are discussions between EU and the AU. There are things that apply in that sense that do not necessarily always have to apply to something else. Uh, if there are, for example, trade issues that are going to be discussed that are specific between African countries and the uh, EU, to insist that they also must apply the same way to others, that may uh, create some uh, uh, discomfort, I'm sure, with, with many people. But if we are talking about, say, even political issues that cover a, a broad range uh, uh, of area, it, it is useful to be discussing matters covering Africa uh, and uh, other related or closely related areas like uh, Caribbean uh, and even Pacific. Uh, so it wasn't uh, more to do with discarding one part and say it doesn't belong to us or doesn't relate to us. In, in my understanding from the beginning, it was technically a way of easing how we uh, deal with each other. And these discussions are still going on. And, and the moment people are sitting down and putting their heads to that, uh, I think always the way will be found out even where people understand things differently. 
I think there is a way of, it's not that one is rigid for this position, another is rigid for that position. The problem is always having to understand what one is talking about and what the other is talking about, and then we, found, we find harmony uh, in, in what we reach as, as, as a, a, an outcome. I, I think that's the way I understood it from the beginning. I'll just add, as I always say, when diplomacy fails, countries go to war. Mm -hmm. When dialogue stops, there will be misunderstandings. So the fact that we have to come and disagree or have different points of view by being there and debating and so on, not shooting at each other, you find solutions. So as the president said, you find solutions to accommodate both views. That's why you go to meetings to debate, to talk, convince each other, and then move on. We are doing that. We are really running out of time, and we, unless I have a permission for Excellency to allow more one question. Last Short one. one. Last one. Uh, good day, uh, Your Excellencies. My name is Albertina Nakale from New Era Newspaper. My question goes to uh, President Kagame regarding the refugees. Uh, Namibia, of course, is, housed, is housing a lot of refugees, including uh, Randis. And I just wanted to find out what is your government doing to help to try to promote this voluntary repatriation of these nationals, perhaps? Because, of course, Namibia has done its part to repatriate a handful of them. So I'm just, I just want to find out what your government is doing in terms of uh, repatriation. We, we've been doing a lot uh, for the last, I should say, um, more actively in the last 15 years. Before that, we were still bringing refugees uh, back home. If you remember, even in uh, the mid-90s, we brought uh, millions of people back home. Uh, and this created, uh, we wanted the people back home uh, as urgent as uh, we, we, we approached it. And we had millions of people coming back home. You remember there were so many people in the DRC, then there were so many in Tanzania, so many in Burundi, especially in neighboring countries. And we brought home uh, our people in millions. Uh, others stayed out of our country. In, again, in, in neighboring countries, there are very few still remaining, and then beyond, especially in Southern Africa, meaning this whole region, uh, has refugees. You find them in Zambia, Malawi, Mozambique, uh, here in Namibia, in Botswana, South Africa itself, there are many. Uh, I mean, many, because even one for us shouldn't be a refugee if we can uh, uh, convince them to come home. But that point, voluntary, is, is very key. Uh, and when it is voluntary, then, I mean, strictly by that word, some people choose not to come back home. For one reason, they may think, uh, I, I'll give an example. Uh, we had people who were supposed to come back home, and uh, Rwanda is very small geographically, we have, and we are one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Uh, having now close, I mean, about 13 million people in just a small space. So, so some people, when they are outside, they say, oh, we have more breathing space here. <laughs> and choose not to come back. Much as we want them to come back, because you know, long ago, before actually we, we took power, uh, the government in Rwanda, the, the genocidal government that was there used to tell people that they cannot come back 
because the country is too small. <laughs> this was the argument they used. And we were saying, no, if a country wants back its people, uh, rightly so, the country is never too small. People will always fit in their country, no matter what. So we, we, we have pursued encouraging people to come back home and even supporting them to come back home and working with UNHCR, the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. We have worked with them from the beginning and then even uh, the, the institution is responsible for migration at the UN level. They have all got involved. And for us, we've been telling people, whoever wants to come back home is welcome. And uh, many people came under that arrangement, uh, and they're still, anyone who still says he wants to come back home, everything is done and availed to make them come home. Those who, for their own reasons, say, no, I can't go home for one reason or another, justified or not. Uh, that's why we still have some of them outside. But the principle that is clear and has been implemented uh, over the years is to want our people back home and whenever they want to come back home and give them support we can give them. And, uh, but of the big problem we had 20 years ago, or slightly before that, maybe we have addressed 90 plus percent of the problem. What really remains is that region of 5 percent. Yes. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Your Excellencies, Honorable Ministers, media, we have come to the end of the program uh, at this media briefing, and I would like to thank their Excellencies for the time uh, to stand there before the media. Media, you put your question forward to them, they've answered you. It's now you to go and tell the story as told. Hopefully it will be reflected in the news for tomorrow. Therefore, for now, I would want you to give us a bit of space there to allow their Excellency to leave and the media you have to exit, uh, go through this way. Your Excellency, thank you. Thank you.